Good morning and welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church. We're all grateful that uh, you could come and join us today to worship the Lord. We have a few announcements, uh, some of which are included in your bulletin. First off, our monthly fellowship meal is after church today, and all are welcome to attend. There's usually plenty of food, so if you didn't have a chance to bring it, don't worry about it. Just come and join for the meal after, after that. So the sequence today, again, we'll have our worship, then that will be uh, followed by a brief uh, coffee break, and then a, uh, a discipleship hour where Pastor Rodney will answer questions and uh, further explain some of the, some of the passages today. Uh, again, uh, there, during that time, there's also uh, a children's Sunday school uh, downstairs. And as part of the uh, discipleship hour in your bulletin, there's a, a piece of paper here. You can write those questions down and you can give it to on the elders and directly to the pastor. Uh, he'll go, uh, Pastor Rodney will go through those during the discipleship hour. Uh, you can also uh, fill it out, put it in the box in the back. Uh, there's also, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, there is a room on the back if you want to you know, write a prayer request. And put that in the back. A sign-up sheet is on the kitchen refrigerator for those interested in bringing refreshments for the discipleship of her. Um, and if you have any questions about that, please speak to Heather Valentine. Uh, the ladies Bible study will meet uh, tonight, uh, downstairs at 7. Sorry, Monday night, downstairs. Uh, covenant of... Uh, is also participating in the Samaritan's Purse Operation uh, Christmas Child this year. Uh, the shoe boxes are there in the back and they're available to uh, pick up. If you do have any questions, I can believe uh, Joanne Longman has uh, uh, no, 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 no. Oh, that's Matt. That's Matt this year, sorry. There's also a, a new members class that's in progress. Uh, but you're uh, still able to join that new members class. That is uh, at 6 p.m. on uh, Wednesday. It's downstairs. So you access the community room downstairs on Wednesday evenings by parking in the parking lot in the back and then going through the back door. And finally, there's a, uh, we had our 30th anniversary reception and uh, celebration service last uh, Sunday evening. There's a, over here uh, to my left, there's a sign-up book, so if you miss signing in there, uh, making comments about the, the 30th reunion, uh, please do. There's also a picture book there, and I believe that's yours. It's a photo album from way back when. Okay, so uh, Susie has graciously loaned a photo album from way back when. And it was going way back when. So that was a, that was a wonderful uh, service. So please uh, sign the book. We'd love to have your comments. Okay, so as we uh, start this morning, we'll be uh, proceeding. Behind me will be the, uh, the meditation. But before I go into that, I'd like to talk a little bit about prayer, prayer chain here. Uh, primarily on the back of, your, back of your bulletin is the primary way that we receive uh, prayers. There's an email address back there. You can put your prayer request together, say that whether or not you want it for public worship or for just uh, uh, confidential worship. Uh, right now, that prayer chain uh, just goes to the elders automatically when you submit that email. So. I know that your leadership is uh, praying for that. Uh, there's a, we also pray specifically for, for your prayers during the session meetings, which are on the second Tuesday of each month. So uh, please submit your prayer, prayer requests. As I said, you can also write prayer requests on the back of this card and, uh, and put it in the, in the 
call the ox on the back or, uh, or give it to one of the wheels. Also on the back, uh, just make sure you know the list of all your church officers, uh, the elders and the deacons. Uh, and uh, please uh, encourage you to keep that on hold. Okay, so with our meditation this morning, uh, I'll, I'll read this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir to God. <clears throat> Please uh, all stand for a call to worship. This uh, call to worship comes from John, uh, verses 5 through 6. And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Please join me in, in uh, prayer. Dear Father God, thank you for calling us to worship you this morning together at Covenant Presbyterian Church as part of our flock in Christ Jesus. We know that you are eternal, infinite, and unchangeable in your being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth, while we are finite, sinful, and fallible beings. So we pray that through your Holy Spirit, our worship to you this morning will give you all glory and honor. And we pray that through your Spirit, Pastor Rodney's message will reflect the light of Christ. For we know that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Please join me now in our doxology.
Please be seated. This morning we'll be uh, uh, reading our corporate confession of uh, faith uh, in a responsive manner. It comes from the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, there are a series of questions. I'll read the question and then we all will respond. Be on the screen behind me or in your bulletin. Okay. As, a, as Christians, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but all my own soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to Him, Christ, by His Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for Him. So, Christian, what must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Three things. First, how angry my sin and misery are. Second, how I am set free from all my sins and misery. Third, how I can thank God for such deliverance. So before we uh, read our corporate confession of sin together, uh, I'll read from 1 John 1, uh, verses 8 and 9. As the Apostle John teaches and God's Word declares, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Likewise, we also have this assurance, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins together. Almighty, Almighty God, God rich in mercy to all of those who call upon you, you hear us as we come to you, Lord, humbly confessing our sins and transgressions, and imploring your mercy and forgiveness. We have broken your holy laws by our deeds and words and by the sinful affections of our hearts. We confess before you our disobedience and ingratitude, our pride and willfulness, and all our failures and shortcomings for you and our fellow men. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, and of your great goodness, grant that we may hereafter serve and please you in the union of life. Through the merit and meditation of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, as we pause, uh, think privately and silently about your sin before the Lord. I receive the Lord's promise of forgiveness from Psalm 32. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not covet my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgive the iniquity of my sin. Please stand as we uh, sing our new praise song. <coughs>
in the back if you put your uh, offerings and tithes in, in there. You can also go online. And uh, if there are other uh, ways to give to the church that may be a little more complex, uh, please see our treasure uh, Keith Smith. So our uh, uh, Ecclesiastes 5, 11 through 12. When goods increase, they increase who eat them, and what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. So, uh, so if you have any questions, uh, please see Keith. So for uh, prayers of the people, Please join with me in prayer. What we'll be doing is uh, I'll pray and then at the end uh, we'll all join together in a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we can only approach your throne of grace in your Son Jesus, who is our great, eternal, and perfect High Priest. We praise you with all gratitude for giving us your Spirit and adopting us while we were dead in our sins into your family of the people of your promise. In this way, we cry out as fellow heirs with Christ, Abba Father, with an assured and better hope in eternal life that acts as an anchor to our soul. Dear God, we honor your name and give you all glory, for the heavens declare your glory. May you strengthen our faith and enable us to preserve through trials and suffering as well as resist temptations to worship idols of our own making, and keep us safe from the evil one. We pray that Covenant Presbyterian Church, through your Holy Spirit, will shine the light of your kingdom in our community, and those that are far from you will hear your voice and be called to a saving grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. May all the world know that you are the true God, and that you are working out your plan of salvation through your people and 
Christ Jesus. May you enable us to repent of our sins and forgive those who have sinned against us. For we know that the grace of Christ is sufficient to cover all transgressions. This morning we lift up those in this congregation that are struggling with health issues. May they feel your presence and love and grant their doctors and nurses with wisdom on how best to treat them. We lift up those who have lost loved ones. As they grieve, may your spirit fill them with peace and knowledge that Christ is always with them. We lift up our children, both young and old. We pray that according to your will, you call them to Christ and sustain their faith as they grow and mature in adulthood. May you guard their minds and hearts from temptations to turn away from you, Lord, and seek worldly passions. For those brothers and sisters in Christ that are not with us this morning, may you be with them and guide them and hold them close in mind. We pray for the persecuted church, especially those leaders, missionaries, and members that are facing loss of livelihood and life. May your armor of God protect them. We lift up our pastor Rodney and his family. We pray that your Holy Spirit provide him with wisdom and stamina to serve, love, and lead your flock here in Covenant Presbyterian Church and to protect his wife and children in the Lord. We pray that you will use them to draw people to Christ. And we pray for our elected federal officials and their professional staffs who are working to finalize various appropriation bills, that you provide them with wisdom to exercise justice and mercy for the good of the nation. But above all, we pray that our nation, both corporately and individually, would grow in the mind of Christ, who truly was treated unjustly in every way, but while we were still sinners, he died for us. May our tithes and offerings be used to sustain and edify your church, and may the reading of your inspired word and message that we are about to receive give you and only you all glory. And Father God, we continue to ask that your Holy Spirit sanctify us in the work of your free grace to renew us after the image of your Son, Christ Jesus, to die unto sin and to live unto righteousness. We ask all these things in the holy and precious name of Christ. As the Lord taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. So uh, today we'll be uh, reading from the Old Testament and Ecclesiastes, sorry, Ezekiel chapter 36. We'll be starting in verse 22 and going through the end of 36. Uh, for the first so please hear the word of our inspired of God. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and I, you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. 
You shall dwell in the land that I give you to your fathers, that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. And I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. And I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant, that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourself for your iniquities and your abominations. It is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited, and the waste places shall be rebuilt. And the land that was desolate shall be tilled, instead of being the desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. And they will say, This land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left all around you shall know that I am the Lord. I have rebuilt the ruined places and planted that which was desolate. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do. Thus says the Lord God, this also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them, to increase their people like a flock, like the flock for sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem during her appointed feasts. So shall the waste cities be filled and the flocks of the people. Then they will know that I am the Lord. In our New Testament reading, we read from the book of Hebrews, and it's chapter 7, starting in verse 11, again to the end of the chapter. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek? Rather than one named after the order of Aaron. For when there is change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is writ witness of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on one, the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath, for those who were formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with him by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but 
the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. And thanks be to God for his inspired and holy word. and tries to get his troops rallied as they're demoralized and kind of wondering, you know, what misery are you going to lead us into? Uh, and as he's sort of moving back and forth, encouraging them in this sort of cinematic drama, he, he has this sort of very iconic speech in which he says, uh, would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that day? for one chance, just one chance, to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our... Ah, I, I, I could not do it justice, so I just left it blank. You know, it was just a guttural, you know, yelp, as uh, Dead Poet Society would say. I, uh, I can't quite muster that, so uh, I'll leave it be. But there's this stirring nature to it <coughs> capture a sort of a bit of a cultural moment and, you know as a re reused I don't know if anyone follows Dave Ramsey but every time somebody becomes debt free he plays this scene uh, and it's it is that moment in this movie that you know captures the, the spirit of this the, the whole epic which is we have a longing for a, a, a type of freedom that, that doesn't have tyrannical oppression. Uh, and that, that almost universal desire for freedom, whether it's expressed in the, the Israelites being delivered from Pharaoh or Moses is saying, let my people go, or in American history with the, you know, the, the, the moving away from uh, American slavery, there's, there's something heart-stirring, and rightly heart-stirring, to the longing to be free. And yet, when freedom is misunderstood, it causes all kinds of problems. There, there's really no end to the misery that can be created if we don't understand what freedom is really supposed to be. Uh, in some sense, uh, you know, Every, every dictator, every tyrant has, you know, espoused the virtues of their own freedom at the cost of everyone else. Uh, and so freedom has to be rightly understood. And, and we're in this moment in, in the book of Romans, which we're, we've been preaching through Romans for uh, a number of months now. And we're in that moment that the whole of the book has been building. Where we're, we've now reached chapter 8. And chapter 8 is that time where the positive components of the good news are laid out with power and clarity, where you have been delivered from and been set free from sin and the wall of sin and death and the consequences, but you've been set free for a life in the Spirit set free from sin and death for life in the Spirit. But, but even more than that, you're set free from sin and death for life in the Spirit as children of God. And, and that last part is essential because you don't know what you ought to be freed from, and you don't know what you're to be freed for if you don't know who you are. Inevitably, knowing what you are freed from and what you're freed for, knowing what to say no to, knowing what to say yes to, knowing where to spend the energy and life and resources that God has given you, 
and how to, do, how to protect and defend those things is inevitably something that flows forth from understanding really who you are. And if you don't know who you are, you, you won't have discernment. Uh, really, all discernment flows from a clear understanding of who you've been made to be and who you're become. And that, that, that sort of most central idea that, that God in His grace, by the work of Christ, has set you free from the fear of sin and death where there is no condemnation, has set you free to live by the Spirit, not to sin, but to, to be free to, to fulfill, to, to love the Lord, which is not less than keeping the command, but it is far more. But ultimately, the passage this morning is going to tell us that the way we find the strength to do that is by knowing who God has said we are. And knowing who God has made us into and how God sustains that sense of who we are and who we're becoming, which really is the power and strength of God at work in our lives and the thing that compels us forward and, and tells us what to defend and, and block and even what to put to death so that life can flourish. So this morning we're looking at uh, Romans uh, 8, uh, verses 1 to 17, in which the book starts to move, Paul's great epistle starts to move into that positive explanation of what you were made to live for. The freedom God wants for you. Uh, a true, life-giving, really wholesome freedom of excellence. And so we'll look at that this morning, Romans 8, 1 to 17. I'll read it, outline it, then pray, uh, and we'll look at this with more, more you know, attention to detail. Romans 8, 1 to 17, let's read it, uh, and then outline it and pray. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned to sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the de dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, for you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified. 
As we mentioned in the introduction, there's three movements to this text. The first is that you've been set free from condemnation. There, are, there is no condemnation for those who are Christ Jesus. And so the whole passage begins with uh, the explanation the, the, and the exposition of your freedom from condemnation. And so you are free from condemnation, but not just free from condemnation, you're free for life in the Spirit. And so you're freed from condemnation for a life in the Spirit, and then lastly, as the family of God. And so in this passage, we see what real freedom looks like. It is a freedom from the tyranny of sin. It is a freedom for life in the Spirit. But you know which one's which when you know that you're really a child of God. And so knowing who we are is the, is the, the way God works out that salvation in us by His Spirit that we might walk with the Spirit and be free from, from condemnation, the fear of sin and death. So without, with that introduction, let's pray, and we'll look at these three things, the freedom from condemnation, the freedom for a life in the Spirit, and freedom to live as the family of God. Let's, let's pray. Uh, Lord, I do pray you bless this preaching of, of your word, that we would uh, be strengthened, that we would be convicted, that we would be renewed, that we would know once again that in Christ there is no condemnation, that we would know once again that as Christ dwells in us, we have a hope of glory that is at work in us even now, giving us the strength and ability to walk with you in faithfulness. And not only that, I pray once again that we would be renewed and reminded that we, in fact, are fellow heirs with Christ. That we are children of the Lord. Children of God. What a great and high enough calling it is to be adopted by the Creator and Redeemer of all things. May this settle in our hearts once again, renewing our spirits, that we might live with a true and righteous freedom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So freedom from condemnation. The passage transitions right here where, where we've moved through the whole of Romans 1 through 7 in which Paul is unfolding the gospel, uh, letting uh, his readers know uh, what he meant way back in chapter 1, that the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. What is that gospel? As he unpacks from, ch from chapter 1 to chapter 7, he has been preparing his audience for this moment in which he is now delivering on all that he has built. And, and, and he, he delivers with this one phrase, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And as he is bringing home, in a sense, the gospel to you, He's reminding you that you have God's unreserved approval. There is no more that can be done. In fact, everything necessary for salvation, everything necessary for you to have a status that secures a glorious future has been fully done. There is no condemnation. You know, and I, as you, there, there is no end to the ramifications of this is, this is something that is visited and revisited and revisited the entire life of a Christian. Because as you, as you, as you think, it, even at the most simple level, never mind a mature level, but just at the most simple level, there's nothing in the world that matters more than what God thinks of. And as you embrace that, as you realize that, you know, do I care what my spouse thinks of you? Of course I do, and you should. Do I care what your children say of you and what they think of you? Of course, you, you, you should care because they, they matter to you. They're important people. And yet all of those important voices, all summed up and multiplied by a thousand, don't outweigh God. And, and, and the, the, the opinion that God is giving for those who are in Christ is that, that you're enough. That you have everything you need. And you have nothing to fear. 
and, and as he's built this whole argument, he's, of course, I mean, he, he's very aware of the sin of the world. <laughs> he, he, you know, Romans 1 and 2, he goes into great detail about all the different things that we should be ashamed of. You know, and as he continues in the, the rest of the, the argument, he, he, he invites us into realizing that you're, you're worse than you realize. <laughs> You know, like, not only are there's a whole bunch of things to be ashamed of, uh, uh, but there's a whole thing, a bunch of things you don't even know are shameful, that really are. You know, and he's like, God isn't, isn't a judge like us. He sees things as bad as they really are. You know, there's no, like, rounding the edges with him. There's no, like, candy coating. He, he sees it as bad as it really is. And not only that, he judges right to the bottom of things. He gets right to the heart. He doesn't just judge, like, you know, the, the outward. He, he judges every intention. And so as, as he's been saying, okay, God is, is not the kind of judge like us. He, he judges rightly. He judges perfectly. He judges precisely. He doesn't tolerate any nonsense. And so even though there's a lot to be ashamed of, the gospel isn't one of them. And even as he judges rightly, he... He looks at each one of his children and he says, I've done enough to cover all of them. And so at this point, even though there's struggle, even though there's a battle, even though there's ongoing battles with sin, even though you're going to fall on your face at times, those who are in Christ, no matter what, have nothing to fear. You're going to fail. You're going to fall short. You're going to stumble. You're going to hurt people. You're going to do wrong things. There's no way around that in our imperfect selves. But every single one of those, God's got covered. And, and at, at this moment, it's, it's, there's no, there's not some, there's not a little bit, there's not even like a smidge. There's just none of it. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so as a result, you're set free from the consequences of sin. You're set free from the power of sin. And now you're just working out how to get rid of it. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say this. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free from Christ Jesus, set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sin and flesh, and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. He's saying you're, you're different now. What you were is no more, and you're a new thing. And that new thing has now got someone living in you that gives you a hope that you can do what's right. And yet, there's a, there's a bit of a battle. And so he's saying, you're being set free. You're no longer, you're no longer in chains. You're, you're set free. I, I, uh, I remember a, uh, uh, a number of years ago, I had a, an, a, 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 a person that I knew, I'd like to call him a friend, but after you hear the story, you, you, know, you know why I'm a little hesitant. Uh, but they owned a reptile that they had encaged. Uh, and they were, you know, I was over at their home and I saw this creepy looking thing. Uh, it was slithering. And, uh, it was, you know, and maybe you love snakes. I don't know. Maybe you're the rare person. I am not a big snake person. Uh, and, uh, and they had the snake caged. And I was like, good, okay. You got things like, okay. <sighs> Uh, and like, okay, come see it. What, you want to pet it? I'm like, ah, that's okay. <laughs> you pet it. Uh, and I was like, I'm glad that it's caged. And she says, yeah, it has to be caged. And I'm like, yeah, is it like a great threat? You know, is it poisonous? Will it strangle you in your sleep? You know. <laughs> like, no, no, it's, it's completely harmless. It's this little, you know. It's like, what if, you get, if it's not caged, my, my mom will, will kill it. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's caged. You know, and, and in part because it's you know it's, you know fearful. You, you cage something to keep it from getting out because it might you think maybe it will harm uh, those outside. But there's another reason that you put it in there is 
you, you protect it from harm that could be done to it. And, and the interesting sort of tension of that is the law functions a little bit like that cage. It, it, it has a good use, right? It, it, keeps, it keeps something or someone from doing harm. It keeps them bound. And so when they want to do wrong, and it, it reduces the ability to do wrong. But it also can protect you from, from harm being done to you. And, and the law sort of plays that so, somewhat beautiful role, even though you say you're encaged, nobody wants to be encaged. Well, you do want to be encaged if, you know, there's a, there's, you know, you're going for a safari and there's like, you know, lions running around. It's nice to be, you know, in a, in a, in a you know, a, a, a vehicle that doesn't have open doors, right? But, you know, you want to be protected. So the, 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 the point of having the law, the point of having something in cage does two great things. One, it protects a person from doing harm when they, when they don't have the right desires and they want to be wrong and inhibit that. But it also can protect you from the harms that are out there. And that, and that right here is saying you're freed from both of those things. And so when Paul is saying you're freed from sin and death, he, he's opening the cage doors. And what he's saying is, I know that God is at work in you. And because God is at work in you, you have no fear of condemnation. The, the consequences of the law, the consequences of, of your sin have been paid. You don't have to fear the harm that's going to be done. You're free from that. But more than that, you're free from that sense of like, there's no good that ever could be done. You're being free to do the good that God is empowering you to do. He's setting you free from sin and, and, and death to have righteousness in life. You're free from sin and its consequences, free from condemnation for a life in the Spirit that gives you a hope that you can do what is good and right. And, and really, those two fears that harm being done by, to and, and, and harm being done by are being mitigated by the work of the Spirit. And because they're being mitigated by the work of the Spirit, we're being set free to do what you were made to do. You're being set free to live the faithful life God wants you to live. Romans 8 uh, continues with this life in the Spirit, where you're free from condemnation for life in the Spirit. And 5 to 8 starts to unpack that, where it says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the Spirit is hostile to God. Or sorry, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. There's two reasons that we hate the law, right? And, and it's directly related to the, the caging, you know, the, the metaphor of being in cage. You hate the law on the first because when it shows you your sin, it shows you that there's a consequence coming. You know, when, when you get caught doing something wrong, you try to pretend like you didn't really do it wrong because you know there's there's a there's a price to be paid. You know, I, I you know, I regularly see this as a, as a father when my, my children do something that they should have not done to one another, and then they pretend like they didn't do it because they know not only am I going to have to tell you you did, but then you're going to be mad at me, and I'm going to be able to be yelling at me. And, and it's like, oh, you know, you, you don't like the rules, and you don't like fessing up to the rules because you know that there's a price to be paid. But what's more, the, reason, the other reason why we hate the law is because it, it keeps us from doing things that we want to do. And, and, there's a, there's a, there, and that, that probably is the, probably the greater hatred that I see. They're both there. But, but the first place you hate is you hate when it tells you there's a record. But the other reason you hate it is you hate when it binds you when you want to do wrong. You want to do the wrong thing, and the law tells you don't do that. And you're like, who do you think you are? God? <laughs> yeah. 
So here, you hate the law, one, for the consequences, and you hate the law, we hate the law, because it gets in the way of the things we want to do that we shouldn't want to do. And here, he's saying there's, there's, there's a way of death. One of the ways of death is when you're afraid of the consequences and it keeps you from doing the right thing because you're afraid of the consequences. And the other way that it's, it's death is when it, when, it, when it wants to stop you from doing things you shouldn't do or it tells you to do things you don't want to do. And you don't want life. You want death. And the law reveals that. But both are life things. Both are right. Both are good. Both show you something you need to see. And here, he's reminding you, there's a way of death and there's a way of life. And yet we hate the way of life because we love things we shouldn't love. And that, and that is such a simple idea, and yet it pervades so many different things where you just want the wrong thing. I just want the wrong thing. And, and I don't really care whether it's right or wrong. I just want it. And Paul's saying, do you really want death? Like, come on. Like, come to your senses. Like, this is nuts. This is the, the height of lunacy that you would become self-destructive. You are pursuing the very thing that is ruining you. Like, this is, this is crazy. Like, come to your senses. And yet he knows the way of sin, the way of wanting what you want, when you want it, how you want it, regardless of its consequences, is part of our sinful nature. And he's saying, God came to help you with that. And more than help you, save you. Because he's come to change the very things you desire, the very eyes that you have, the very heart that you've been given. He's come to, to, to change it so that you see things differently and your heart is renewed. It's something deeper and more profound than just changing your outward behavior. And Romans, 9 to, and Romans 8, 9 to 11 continues with this, where it says, For however, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of God does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will, will give you, so will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This is, this is, uh, a very helpful corrective to, to folks that largely fall into kind of what we call a reformed tradition. It's thoroughly reformed, don't get me wrong. But we misunderstand it. We misunderstand what the scriptures actually teach. And one of the things that we, we are very good at, as a general rule of thumb, is we're very good at realizing we're sinners. And that's good. We should. You're, you're terrible. Uh, you know. <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I'm going to recant of that. I'm terrible too. Uh, we, we are sinners in need of grace. And, and part of what is needed is not to candy coat that, not to, to, to sidestep it, not to be weak on it. No, you, you need the grace of God and you need it desperately. You are worse than you realize at a very high degree. And, and one of the things we're very good at is kind of helping you feel bad about yourself. You know? It's uh, kind of what keeps pastors in business, right? You know. But here, this passage, it it it, it, it takes a different a different tone. It adds it adds some 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 context. It it shows you that that's not the only truth, and in fact, there's a more important truth. It's that God is at work in you, and God is more powerful than your sin. And so as much as you're a sinner, God's a savior. And if you're ever so fixated on how bad you are, and that's where you get lost, you, you've really lost the gospel. Because the gospel isn't really about how bad you are, it's really about how good God is. 
And, 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 and one of the things that we get stunted in is we get that first point where, you know, the wrath of God comes down from, is coming down from heaven on all ungodliness. That's biblical. You do not avoid that. You look it right in the face and you preach it clearly. But you don't forget that Romans 1 through 7, it's all building to tell me Romans 8. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because Jesus has done what's necessary and the Spirit now is cleaning you up. He's at work giving you hope that your actions aren't only sinful all the time. No. No, He is at work in you. And, and, and there's no, no condemnation and in fact there's a power being unleashed in you that's transformative. Grace doesn't just make you not afraid of condemnation on the last day. It, it does that. But it also changes you today. In which you are not the same person today that you were yesterday by God's grace. And tomorrow you will not be the same person you are today. And the more that you come under God's saving grace, the more you hear that there is a God who transforms you by His Spirit in the power of the gospel. You are renewed and you are becoming more the person God always wanted you to be. And so we aren't these hopeless, like, oh, I'm so sinful, poor as me. No, no, I'm 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 I am sinful. And 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 I'm not yet what I will be, but I'm not what I was. And God is powerfully at work in us. And and, and to 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 Exalt your own sin too high is really to bring God down. And, and, and that's not that's that's not Christian. Now God is God is mighty. In fact, much mightier than your sin. In fact, that's what exactly this passage is getting at. The God who is at work in you will chant will transform your sinful flesh into a glorious spirit. And he's doing it right now. You are not just freed from sin, you're freed for righteousness. And by God's grace, through His Spirit, you can do it. And, and, and it's not easy, I said last week. It's simple, it's not easy. But it's true, and it's real, and it's powerful. I once heard a, a pastor give an illustration of a, an acorn, and he, you know, he didn't have the regular principles, so he could bring out object lessons. Uh, and he he, uh, he had his acorn out and, and uh, I'm joking, he was acorns too. Uh, <laughs> but the and he, he was saying, you know, this has got the power of the forest in it. And he, he gave this illustration of this this went on this trip and in the, the travels he he saw this enormous stone that was split in two because it had a little crack in it, and in the little crack a nut had fallen. And the nut had taken root. And it, it was so powerful, it took, it took decades, but it was so powerful that this boulder that just you would think you would, you would need this massive amount of dom dynamite to, to, to split it. This one little acorn did. Because in that, in, that, in that acorn was a power that although it worked slowly, it had the power of life. And that power can split rock. You know, and the, the, the spirit is just like that. It, 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 he, he is a power that he brings a power of life that splits our, our, our hearts of stone. And he himself dwells in that heart and makes it a heart of flesh. It changes. And if, if God is at work, your sin isn't too, too strong for him. You know, your hopelessness and your sin is overcome by the hope of God every single time. And, and, and the gospel is, yes, you are more sinful than you, you realize, but, but also more dearly loved. And, and the, God, the God who is capable can change you, even you. If you don't believe that, you have way too high a view of yourself. You know, God is greater than you are, and he can change you. And in fact, he does. And that's exactly what Paul is reminding us of here. That, that although you are a sinner, God is a savior.
was interesting too. Uh, I was I was reading uh, reading. I have no idea why, but I was reading Robert Frost's uh, uh, famous poem, "The Road Not Taken," and and interesting. The, the end of the, of the poem, if you're, it's a, it's, this is his most famous work, but it ends with this, you know, three lines where it says, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Here's an okay, well, how is the preacher going to do that? Uh, I always took that as, a poem about how much and how important it is to take a path that no one else took, right? And that's sort of the way you kind of read it and it sort of like gripped the American individualism. And I was reading about what, what Robert Frost said about his own poem. And one of the things he said, it was, it was hilarious, you know, it's like he, he's, he's such a guy. Like he, he was inspired this, this great work of poetry was inspired because he was making fun of one of his friends. Uh, and it's like, uh, he, had a, he had a British poet he, who, who could never decide which way to go when they were walking together. And whatever way he went, he'd always afterwards complain, oh, we should have went the other way. And he was annoyed with his friend, so he wrote a poem. <laughs> it's like, oh, slay this guy with a poem. And it comes this iconic poem that's sort of making fun of his friend who could never make up his mind. Uh, which way to go. And, and it's like, this has become this, this, this iconic poem of American individualism going your own way, the way no one else goes. That's really just making fun of his friend who couldn't make up his own mind. And, and what, the point that was being made there is, you know, at least as I read it, you know, the thing that really mattered to him was who was walking with him. You know, and, and as much as this is all some of the concepts and is this the right idea, is that the right idea, and you're battling over ideas, and that's good. And it's good to think correctly and, and to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. That's part of the Christian work. But I would say the more important thing is just making sure you're walking with the Lord. It's who you're walking with. And, and this whole passage is just reminding you, yes, the law, you know, the, those who have their mindset on the flesh cannot please God. Why? Because they don't do what God says. The law matters. He's saying right in here, doing the right thing matters. But walking with the Lord is how it's done. And as this, this whole passage kind of unfolds and you're thinking about who are you walking with, or even more than that, he's walking with you. That's the thing that grounds you. That's the thing that gives you direction. That's the thing that reminds you whether you take the path that's less traveled or the path that's more traveled. Who's walking with you? And here, the thing that, that Paul is reminding you and me and all of us is there is a God who walks with you through life who is empowering you, who is living in you, who is convicting you and encouraging you and reminding you over and over again. This is who you really are. And it ends not with just sort of, okay, stop sinning, start doing the right thing. He, that's the opposite of what he says here. Because he just said, telling you the law isn't going to save you. He's been spending seven chapters saying, if I tell you do this and don't do that, and I only tell you that, I'm going to stir up your sin. I'm going to leave you in a worse place. And so you can say, well, what you really need is you need to be freed from sin and you need to be freed from righteousness. You need to stop doing the bad stuff. You need to start doing the good stuff. And you would be just as lost. Because you understand the discernment, the, the process, and the power when you know who's walking with you. When you know there is a God who has told you there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Sin and death are taken care of. The consequences already wiped out. At least in, 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 in a sort of divine sense. And now, I'm working at it in you. And as you walk with me, 
I'm going to make you right. It's his work as we work. And, and it, it drives home this last point, which is this, we are freed from condemnation for a life in the Spirit as the family of God. And you see, you don't really, you don't really have the power to, to, to put aside fear and sin. You don't really have the power to live in the Spirit until you realize by God's grace that he is working in you, telling you over and over again, I'm your father. And I've done everything necessary to, to call you my child. And it drives this last point home. Romans 8, 12 to 17, where it really brings this concept home. It says, so then brothers, family, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. There's this famous uh, uh, Puritan book by John Owen called The Mortification of Sin. And in this book, he, he reminds his readers as he looks at all of you know, the teachings of the, the scriptures and and really is focusing in on this passage in Romans 8, he reminds his readers that the Christian life is a consistent, lifelong work that every, in which every Christian depends on the grace of God daily. Uh, and, and, and that by, by grace, through faith in Christ, there's, there's hope. But it's a daily struggle. And in the midst of this, he says this. He says, you know, in, in sort of Puritan language, so forgive that, but he says, do you mortify? Do you make it your daily work to, to, to always be at it while you live? Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin, or it will be killing you. And, and he drives home this point, be killing sin, or it will be killing you. It is a, it is a destructive force. It isn't a lovely thing. It isn't a cute thing. It's a thing that will ruin you. It starts small and it grows and it never stays where you put it. It, it, it. And as a result, we are working to, to put it to death. But if you try to put it to death the wrong way, you'll just spread it around. And, and the, the thing that, that, is, that we constantly need to be reminded of is putting sin to death really happens when you realize who you really are. And it's not just sort of like strengthening your inner resolve and saying, I'm going to do the right thing now and I'm going to not do the wrong thing. That's fine. It's just not enough. The thing you need is you need God working in your heart reminding you who you really are. You need to be reminded who God really is. And it's, and it's a work of God that happens in your heart. And as you come regularly to worship, Privately in your own study or your own prayer closet, and, and, and especially here in regular corporate worship, you're reminded over and over again you have a great God who saves, who has called you his own, and is asking you to live like it. And that's it. He's done it. And, and again, Romans 8 drives this home, last part, where it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be given them. You see, like our great Savior suffered and was glorified, and he has set up heaven. We suffer and we're glorified. And that 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 putting to death sin has a has an element of suffering to it. It always does. But it also has glory. And that that struggle is is always worth it. And the thing you see is in Christ it's worth it. And I was uh, was talking with someone recently, and uh, 
we got into the conversation and it, it was sort of like a, you know, a fun conversation. And, and the question came up, and I don't really remember how it came up, but the question came up is if your, if your house was on fire and you could say one thing, what would it be? And I was like, oh, that's kind of a fun question. And I'm thinking, okay, what would it be? And I was like, and, and the other person had a very clear answer. So, so well, you know, I, I'm not sure what I'd say. I mean, you can get your kids out and your animals. That's, that's the easy one. But like what piece of property? And the person told me, without a doubt, the thing that they would say is their wedding album. You know, it's like, oh, so romantic, you know. And I'm like, okay. No, it's like, no, no, no. Like, and, and, and the, the, they, they went into details. Like, this is why. And, and they expressed that they had gone from a pretty tough childhood. And they had found this really healthy, strong relationship. And this relationship had such a deep impact on them. It really changed their life. And as a result of this relationship, they, they found themselves being a parent, and they found themselves having a, a, a new way of seeing themselves. And that at this moment, it was just one moment, but it was one moment that changed everything. And they, they saw themselves differently, because someone else saw them differently. And as important as it is to have those people in our life that God works through that helps us see ourselves differently, that is what that is what the Spirit does. He says, you are my beloved child. There's nothing I wouldn't do for you. And no matter what adversity comes, I will always go out for your good. And if the God of the universe says that about you, what kind of confidence does that inspire? What kind of gratitude does that produce? What kind of hope does that lead to? <laughs> And, and, and honestly, there, there is a power to that that God, by His Spirit, brings into your life when you realize God's really for me. Like, the God of the universe wants good for me. And there's no power that's not at His disposal. There's no affection that He has that's even the slightest bit impure. And if He is for you, who can be against you? answer, of course, is no one. No one. And that changes everything. You don't squabble over little commandments like, you know, how much money should I give away? Or, you know, what kind of words should I use? Or should I, you know, oh, it's like, okay, that's the small stuff. Like, you'll do all of that if you know who you belong to. If you know who you really are. And you stop pretending to be something you're not. You are a child of God. And when you behold that, and when that hits your heart, and your heart overflows, God, my Father, when you know that's the relationship that you have with God, everything changes. And that is a work of God's Spirit that unleashes a power that cannot be stopped by your sin. And you see, that, that's, the, that's the thing Paul wants for us. That's the thing God wants for us. He wants you to have a power that's, that overcomes sin. And he knows that's the only one that can do it. He's the only one that can do it. Not you and me. But he does it. And when you realize he does it, and you let him do it, and you trust him, and you walk with him, and you know, is it the left path or the right path? I don't care as long as God's with it. If he's with me, whatever he needs, that's where I want to go. And when you start asking that question, it's not up to you, it's up to him. And when that happens, you become powerful, you become transformed, and you become holy. Because the God who is powerful and transformative and holy is with you. And that's our hope. It always has been and it always will be, all the way to glory. And that's what Paul wants us to remember. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And because there's no condemnation, you're free. Completely free. The cage is open. Go thrive. But thrive in such a way that you live and walk with the Spirit and you know the one who really loves you. 
one who will guide you perfectly. Walk with him. Let's pray. Lord, we know we're free from condemnation to live and walk with the Spirit as children of the Lord, as children of our Heavenly Father. And that, that changes everything. That, that is the thing that produces gratitude and joy and hope and a, and a strength to persevere when everything around us seems to be falling apart. Because we know you are the one who puts all things together. And whatever you're doing, we want to do that with you. We want to be with you. <coughs> You've made us new creatures. You've given us hope. You are a greater Savior than we are sinners. And because of that, we don't just look at ourselves with despair and disgust. We look at ourselves and we see what we're becoming. And we see a glorious work that you're doing. And as a result of that, we have a hope and a glory and an assurance that is far greater than anything we can accomplish. Work in us that we might do your works. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let's respond in song. We're going to sing uh, 335, which is Gracious Spirit. Well, let's stand in song. <laughs> Because we so frequently use the term Holy Spirit uh, and that it kind of loses its, its force. That this is the Spirit that is pure and true and gracious and mighty and holy. And as He dwells with us, He makes us more like Himself. And that's what gives us hope. And as we come to the table once again, we are, we are strengthened by that same Spirit, have confidence that we can say there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, then we can say the Spirit is dwelling with us, and, and therefore we can say, we come to you, our Abba, Father, the one who is our, our true Heavenly Father. We're children of God. And every time we come to his table, we're reminded who invites us uh, as family to that table. And so this table is for those who have put their trust in Jesus, who are in Christ, and have made that public by joining a church that believes in Jesus. 
So if that's true of you, you belong to a church that believes in Jesus, and you put your trust in him, uh, this table is for you as we celebrate as the family of God. Because we, by the Spirit, say, Abba, Father. So let's pray. Lord, we do uh, come before you and your table and ask that you would use these common elements for your spiritual purposes. That you would bless, that you would strengthen, that you would dwell with us, and that you would meet with us by your Spirit in these elements. May you nourish our faith that we might be renewed once again to, to hate sin and love righteousness because of who we really are. We are children of God. Help us to know that more deeply, more profoundly, more completely this morning. And in so doing, may we hate sin and love righteousness because that's who we are. Please meet with us and bless us spiritually for we need your grace each day. We pray this in Jesus' name. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was portrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Uh, as we uh, are given the, the bread, uh, it is in individual cups. Please take as you are individually ready. In the same manner, he also took the cup, and having given thanks, he gave it to the disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. As the cups are passed around, uh, the outer circle is grape juice and the inner circles are wine. Please take as your conscience leads, and also please wait for everyone to be served, and we'll take the cup together.
Once again, Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Let's strength to God. Please stand as we sing the glory of God. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 25 this morning, followed by the benediction, receive the charge. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Receive the benediction. May our triune God grant you a renewed sense that you are in fact children of God, and that your heart may always say, Abba, Father, knowing that through Christ you have no fear of condemnation, and that by the power of the Spirit you have a hope of glory that is tasted now and looks forward to all eternity in which it will only get better. May you know that now and forever, and may that give you an undying hope. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing May the Peace of God together. <laughs> Thank you. 